In part one of Jim Rickard's discussion with Daniela Cambone, the NYT best-selling author said that, the coexistence of economic sanctions and kinetic warfare is nothing new. Rickard said the escalating tension between the United States and Russia did not occur overnight. Saying that Ukraine should, be a buffer state and neutral, Rickards emphasizes that economic sanctions punish not only Russian citizens but also American citizens. The effect is already here and will get much worse, Rickards says, implying that there will be major food shortages as Russia invades Ukraine. The Chinese yuan and the Russian ruble will not replace the dollar as the world reserve currency, he concludes. Listen to the full podcast to understand what's going on the food market, and are we witnessing a food shortage? Please follow us on YouTube and open your notifications for further podcasts. Enjoy. I'd like to start uh, by getting your thoughts, obviously, on Russia and Ukraine and uh, something that you recently wrote that what happens in Russia doesn't stay in Russia. Russia may be the first victim of U.S. sanctions, but the entire world will pay the final price. Now, there's a lot to unpack here. Um, so that's that's kind of where I wanted to start uh, with you today, is that the buck doesn't stop here, right? Th these are repercussions that we will be felt for for how many years, Jim? Well, the repercussions may be felt for ten years or longer, uh, but the the uh, the immediate impact is going to go well beyond um, uh, you know the so-called sanctions. What the point I was really making was we're slapping sanctions on Russia. Russia is hitting back with some retaliatory actions, uh, and it's pretty easy to, to look at the direct impact of that, but there's second order and third order effects that will pop up all over the world and could very quickly get out of control. And think of it as the economic equivalent of a nuclear war. Nobody wants a nuclear war, uh, but I studied uh, a nuclear war fighting actually in the beginning of the late 1960s. Uh, with uh, you know Herman Kahn, Henry Kissinger, the Wallstetter, the leading scholars of the time, um, and they had different theoretical views. A lot of what of it was game theoretic. Of course, we didn't actually have a nuclear war, but the, they, the the one thing they all said in common, the one thing they all shared was don't go there. And what they meant was that nobody wakes up and says, "Oh, gee, I think I'll start a nuclear war today." What a good idea! That that never happens. But what does happen is you get into an escalatory situation back and forth and back and forth where you're escalating and escalating and you end up in a nuclear war you never intended it never started out that way but you end up there through escalation now take that and that that, that is good analysis take that and apply it to what is now i would say the first full-scale economic war uh sanctions war we've had sanctions you know for a long time I mean, going back to the at least the 70s with with iran but even before that i mean fdr put sanctions on japan in august august 1941 and then uh, five months later they bombed pearl harbor so uh the the the, the coincidence not coincidence but the uh the, the coexistence or interaction of economic sanctions and kinetic warfare is is nothing new so we've had it before nothing on this scale this is uh, unprecedented in its scope and application uh, and my only point is it, it, the effects of this are going to not just last a long time, yes, but they're going to pop up in very, very unexpected places. And Daniel, one thing quickly before we jump into yep. this, obviously, economic sanctions, economic warfare are among my areas of expertise. I've done a lot of it for years, but you know, I do a, a seminar for um, kind of mid-career big thinkers in the military run by the U.S. Army War College, but it involves all branch, and I teach the seminar in financial warfare. Um, so it's kind of my topic, but I don't want to, you know, overlook the, the human tragedy and the human cost and the civilian casualties from what's going on in Ukraine. So when I talk about economic effects, I'm not you know, un either unaware of that or, or, or unsympathetic. We certainly all pray for the victims of this, but, um, uh, you know, that's, that's on the news every night. We get enough of that, but I don't think the, the economic side of it, which is our subject, is not that well understood. Yeah, and you're right, or oftentimes it's just kind of brushed aside like, oh, there's economic sanctions, and we don't really understand what that really means. But before we unpack that and really go and take a deep dive there, um, you know, the beauty of, of Twitter is that you can, uh, you, can, you can look back in history, and there's a tweet of yours uh, that came up from 2015, Jim, because you're talking about how these things don't brew overnight. And back in 2015, this is the soothsayer that you are, you had written or tweeted, Russia is arming uh, Ukraine rebels and U.S. is preparing to arm Kiev. So we'll have a nice little U.S.-Russia proxy war soon, just like hashtag Vietnam. Did you expect anything like this? Um, 
I, I did. It, uh, let me make the, let me make the point. This was uh, there was never a war that was easier to prevent. There was, there's never been a war that's easier to prevent, and there's never been a war that's easier to end. Uh, the, you could end this war in 48 hours or less. Uh, having said that, I did expect that through a series of policy blunders and escalation, in this case military escalation and political escalation, that this war would take place. And, and thank you for mentioning that, uh, Danielle. That's from 2015. Go back to 2011, my first book, Currency Wars. Um, it, the first two chapters of that are an economic war game. And then later in the book, around on page 250 or so, I have a whole section on Ukraine, Russia, and natural gas. So this has been brewing for a long time. Um, you can go back to the 2008 Bucharest Declaration. But if you, if you want to pick one thing and say, hey, when, when did this thing take a turn for the worse right. so that we were on a path to war? That was the color revolution sponsored by Obama and Biden, um, which was a coup d'etat. I mean, the, the president of Ukraine at the time, he was pro-Russian. He was nobody's idea of a, of a nice guy, but he was duly elected. They had a democracy and he was elected and he had the uh, you know, the plurality and the uh, coalition of the parliament. And Obama set out to depose him, and they did. And they put in Poroshenko, who was a U.S. puppet. And at the same time, like a month, well, two months after the color revolution, one month before Poroshenko, uh, Putin took Crimea. He said, okay, that's how you want to play. Fine. Uh, you throw out, you move away from neutrality, move towards NATO, NATO I'll take Crimea, your move. And then there was nothing. To, Putin didn't take one square inch during the Trump administration, because Trump is, Trump is highly unpredictable, but put Biden back in, who was part of the original Obama-Biden team, and here we are again. So you could you could easily see this coming. Yeah, that's an, that's an interesting uh, point that I want to get back to. If, if the Russians had, you know, the propaganda to put Trump in power, why wouldn't he have done it under Trump? because they didn't have the propaganda to put Trump in power. That was a lie concocted by Hillary Clinton, pursued by the Democratic National Committee. And, you know, if I'd said that, well, I did say that um, six years ago, but when you said it six years ago, you were disregarded as a kook. But now, um, you know, through multiple investigations, uh, reports, uh, um, that information is out there. In fact, it's worse than that. Not only was the Trump-Russia, you know, collusion hoax, which has been thoroughly looked at by congressional committees, the, uh, the Department of Justice Inspe Inspector General, the Mueller Commission, every, everybody looked at it, bipartisan, independent, et cetera, all said the same thing. It was a hoax. It was, it was a fake dossier. It never happened. So not only was Trump not in Putin's pocket, uh, he was the only one who stood up to Putin in such a way that Putin didn't take one square inch of territory. He took Crimea under Obama. Now he's taking kind of half the country under Biden. Didn't take anything under Trump. So that completely debunks that. But just to take it one step further, who is in the pocket of, um, of, the, of the Ukrainians, at least? And the answer is Joe Biden, because of Hunter Biden, who made millions of dollars from Burisma, their large natural gas company. Ukraine is ranked... Uh, in the low 90s of the of the most corrupt countries in the world. In other words, the it's at the bottom on a corruption list with the best with the, with the most honest countries being on top. Um, Ukraine is very close to the bottom. It's it's the most corrupt country in Europe, one of the most corrupt countries in the world. Zelensky is just another oligarch, just another phony, um, and he uh, just um, uh, banished. Uh, 11 political parties that make up the rest of the parliament. He banned all their parties, arrested some of their leaders, took over the state media. He's got you know, tens of millions, if not more, stashed away in the bank. Um, so he's just, he's another corrupt, uh, this thing about, you know, Zelensky's in the Churchill, I mean, give me a break. He's, he's one of the most corrupt officials around, just another oligarch. Now, you can take sides, but to me, Putin's a dictator, Zelensky's a dictator. You know, pick your dictator. But um, this idea that he's some, you know, good guy Democrat is nonsense. I want to get back to your point when you said this war could be over in 48 hours. How would that play out for you? Well, it's a phone call, basically. I mean, Biden, uh, Biden's kind of non mentis, but somebody with uh, who can, you know, string a few sentences together needs to call Zelensky and say, um, here's what we're going to do. You, you're not going to join NATO. Well, we'll get the, the NATO Secretary General, John, John Stoltenberg, uh, to say that. You need to say it, and the U.S. will say it. So you're not going to join NATO. You're not going to join the EU. You can be independent in the sense of being autonomous, but you have to be neutral. And there are plenty of models for this. Uh, 
you know, Finland during the Cold War, Austria during the Cold War, um, you know, potentially Ukraine today. Um, there's when, when you've got two great powers, whether it's the U.S. and Russia or um, the U.S. plus Europe and Russia confronting each other, uh, the idea of buffer states, I mean, that's as old as, uh, you know, if not history, uh, at least the, the history of buffer states is uh, several centuries old at this point. It's, it's a part of what every international uh, strategist uh, looks at. So Ukraine should be a buffer state. It should be neutral. Uh, that way Putin has no reason to invade and we have no reason to try to push the borders of NATO to a point slightly east of Moscow, which uh, Moscow hasn't been attacked from the east since Genghis Khan.